Debbie. And thanks for checking out this message today. We're glad you're here and we would love to get connected with you and your family. One easy way you can do that is to text River Connect to 97000. You can also visit our website at theriverchurch.cc to learn more about us and some upcoming events. Lastly, if you would like to give to the River Church today, you can text the amount you want to give to 84321, or you can head to our website and click the Give tab at the top of the page. Thanks again for joining us, and we hope you enjoy today's message. All right, well, uh, in that tremendous, uh, classical, timeless, theological work, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Um, <laughs> you've seen it, right? Incredible. Indiana Jones, right? He is in search of a cup that the Lord Jesus is supposed to have you know, drank from. It's called the Holy Grail. And at the end of that movie, spoiler alert, which, by the way, if I'm spoiling this movie for you, I told First Gathering this, you need to get up right now, you need to leave the church and go home and watch that movie. That's fine, just... You're like, did you just tell me to leave church and go watch Indiana Jones? Yes, I did. It's that important, okay? Um, so at the end of the movie, right, he comes to this room, if you remember, full of uh, ornate chalices and, and intricately designed goblets and, you know, gold and silver and gems and all these things, right? And uh, he is told to choose from among the hundreds of cups that are there, which one did the Lord Jesus drink from? The Holy Grail, you know? And of course, there's a guy who's there who, you know, makes a, a very poor decision and chooses the most ornate cup he could basically find and dips it into the water and takes a drink and just, it's awesome if you haven't seen it. It's just fantastic, okay? You're like, what happened? That's your assignment. Go home and watch it. Okay. But, um, but then, right, Indiana, he's like, he finds this just really simple, common-looking cup. And he says, this is the cup of a carpenter, you know. And he grabs this cup, and he dips it, and he takes a drink. And, and the guardian of that place says to him the now famous words, you have chosen wisely, right? In front of us this morning is something like that. The Lord is setting before us a choice to choose between two things. And, and, and He wants us to choose wisely, not poorly. The area of, of interest that we are talking about this morning is how do we help? How do we give to help other people? There is one way of doing this, which is the way of man. The way of man calls attention to ourselves. It calls attention to us. And you'll see this morning, it is a very foolish way to go. But the other way to give and to help and to meet the needs of other people, the other way to do this is the way of the Lord. And it calls attention to Him. It brings blessing into our lives and into the lives of the people around us. And it is to choose wisely, according to Jesus. So let's look at these two choices that are set before us this morning. Jesus begins this subject on giving to meet the needs of others with a warning to be careful. This is what he says. He says, Take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. So this begins again, begins with a warning to take heed. The words there mean to pay careful attention to something. So in other words, don't just go and meet the needs of others. Be careful to do it this way. To be careful to not allow something to happen in this process. And so this term, take heed, was actually a nautical term. It was the term that was used uh, for the captain of a ship to keep a ship headed in the right direction, to be careful to keep it from drifting off course. This is what Jesus is telling you and I, to be careful that the, that the boat doesn't drift off course in our giving to meet the needs of others. It's in the negative, which means... We are to avoid or steer clear of something. And so this would be like uh, an iceberg in the water, if you, if you will. If you hit this iceberg, 
It's going to do damage to your life, but as you'll see in a few moments, it'll do damage to your reward, and it's a big deal. You'll see it in a moment, but we've got to be careful to avoid it. So what are we talking about? Well, we're talking about our charitable deeds. What, what is this? The word refers to seeing the need of somebody else, feeling that need, and then doing something to help them in that need. It's connected to the word mercy. It means I see that you're going through it, I feel that you're going through it, and now I'm going to do something to help you in that. Okay, That's what we're talking about with charitable deeds. Now, it can be any way that you are helping another person who are in need. So, uh, some examples. You're taking a meal to somebody um, that's going through difficulty, or you're, you're paying bills for somebody, or you're dropping off groceries or Christmas gifts for, for a family, or whatever that might be. It could be just going and, and sitting with someone you know, in their home, or it could be cleaning their, their house because they're not able to, or mowing the yard, or whatever it might be. And of course, it, it can be money too. But, but, but Jesus is talking about any way that we are helping someone else in need. And he tells us, you've got to be careful with the way that you do this. And this is a warning to every one of us, and you'll see why in just a few moments. But listen, before we move on, I think we have to point out something that is obvious, but maybe it's not. Okay? Did you notice that Jesus assumed that we are helping people in need? Did you notice that? He does not begin with, now if you help people in need, do it this way. He basically starts with, when you're helping people in need, do it this way. Jesus is assuming that we, as his people, are seeing the needs of others, feeling the needs of others, and then stepping in to help. You might say, well, I don't have a lot to be able to do that. And I would say, we've got to read our Bibles, right? Because we all have three things, time, talent, and treasure, to be used by God to the benefit of other people. Now, let me just get this off the table. There is not going to be a special offering this morning in just like a few moments. We're not setting you up, okay? We're not talking about your giving to the church. We are not talking about that. We are talking about you being used by God in the lives of others, okay? That's what we're talking about this morning. So, he says, when you do this. Now, this forces us to stop and ask the question. Before we can talk about how to do it, there's really a question before that. Are we doing it? Are you and I seeing the needs of others, feeling their need, and then stepping in to help others in their need? I think one of the things that can happen is we can very often and very easily only see our own needs, only feel our own issues, only try to get our own stuff fixed. That is not the way of the Lord. It's not the way of the Lord. Flip it completely around and you find what God wants us to be doing. So the question is, are we? See, what Jesus is talking about this morning is not meant to be filed away uh, for a time when we might have extra and we could maybe possibly help somebody. That is not the purpose. This is not merely educational. It's not theoretical. This is practical. This is Jesus saying, this is what I want you doing. And this is how I want you doing it. And so with that, let me ask you a question. Are you a jar or are you a funnel? You're like, what? Are you a jar or are you a funnel? What is the difference between the two? Well, a jar, simply, things are put into it, and it keeps those things, right? It collects, it holds those things. Is that you? Are you a collector of things? Are you a holder of things? We take a jar, we put stuff into it, we seal it up, we tuck it away, we store it for ourselves, for a later date, whatever that might be. Are you a jar in terms of the things God has given to you? Many people are jars, right? Or are you a funnel? What is a funnel? Well, we pour into a funnel and it pours out into something else, right? Right? This is what God wants you and I to be, a funnel. 
Are you the person that understands that what comes into your life has been given to you so that it can not only bless you, but then be poured out, funneled out to others in life who are in need, others as God directs to bless those people. Are you a jar or are you a funnel? Now, the Lord wants us to be these funnels. And what's amazing about a funnel is that as you pour into it and it pours out to others, uh, here's what's amazing. We always have what we need. The funnel is always being poured into. The funnel always has what it needs. It just becomes the conduit for God to bless somebody else. And these are the things that the Lord assures us of. This is the kind of stuff that he says in the scriptures. You can be this funnel because I'll take care of you and then I'll be able to take care of others. It's awesome. Jesus describes it this way. Let me read it in Matthew 6. He's describing, essentially, to be a funnel here. Watch this. Therefore, I say to you, you don't have to worry. You don't have to worry about your life. When you're a funnel, you don't have to worry about this. Watch. What you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on is not life more than food and the body more than clothing. Look at the birds of the air, he says. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Here's what Jesus says, verse 31. Therefore do not worry, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or of what shall we wear? He says, this is what the, this is what the person who is unsaved, who doesn't have a father, worries about. You you don't have to worry because I'm your father. Look what he says. For after all these things the Gentiles seek, your heavenly father knows that you need all these things. So relax. You can seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things shall be added to you. This is Jesus's way of saying, be a funnel. Don't be a jar. And man, it is a blessing to be a funnel of the Lord. It puts the fun in funnel. I just came up with that. I think we should make a t-shirt. I don't know. People would be like, that's a weird shirt, you know? Um, But like, right? My brain is going a million different directions right now. I've got to stop. Okay. But like, listen, that it really is a blessing to know that you are taken care of and that God can actually use you to bless, help, and take care of other people. That you can, if you really know this, if you're really settled in this, you can allow God to use you in this way. Even if you have very little, you still have your time, you still have your talent, your gifting that God has given to you, and you still, in some measure, have your uh, treasures, right? You still have things that God has given to you, resources that can be used to bless others, Every one of us do. And when we are sure that we can employ those things for God's use, man, we can be free to do it. And God uses us in this incredible way. Well, he warns us actually about being a jar. I don't know if you know this. He warns us about this. In Luke chapter 12, verse 16, he uh, gives us a picture of a man who decided he was going to just be a jar, not be a funnel. Watch this. The ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. Oh, wow, awesome. God blessed this man's you know, crops, and and it it abounded. Great. The ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully, and he thought within himself, saying, what shall I do to bless all the people around me? That's not what he said. He thought to himself, how can God use all of this? There are so many I could help and take care of. That's not what he thought. He said, what shall I do? I don't even have any more room to store everything I have. You know what I'll do, he says. I'm going to pull down my barns and I'm going to build bigger barns. More room to store my stuff. Well, verse 19, he says, I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Relax, take it easy, drink, eat, drink, and be merry. But here's what God says to him in verse 20. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul will be required of you. You're going to die tonight. Then whose will all of these things be? 
Who, who, will this, who will this belong to? He says, the things that you have stored away. That's the word provided there. Verse 21, Jesus says, so is he who stores up treasure for himself. We think that's becoming rich, Jesus says, but it is not rich toward God. That's not riches. True riches, being a funnel to, to, for God to use you, that is richness. That is the stuff that really makes life what life is supposed to be. Not storing up, not holding on to. So this is a choice today. God doesn't want us to be jars, collecting all that we can, storing it up for ourselves. He wants us to be a funnel that he can pour through to others. So this is really where we have to start. Before we start looking at even Jesus' instruction on how to do this, we have to begin with an honest evaluation of our heart. We've got to pause to say, am I doing this? Am I personally doing this? Have I made the decision to be a funnel rather than a jar? And if we have not, then this would be the moment to repent to the Lord and to, uh, and, and to, and to decide this and to ask God to help you with it. Okay, well, from here, we can look at how. And here's what Jesus says. This is the iceberg in the water, if you will. He says, don't give to meet the needs of others. In whatever way you do that, don't do it in a way to be seen. Okay, to be seen. He says, do not do your charitable deeds before men. It's literally in front of people to be seen by them. Now, the word seen there means to stare at, to concentrate on. Here is, what we do, here is what we are to avoid. We are to, revo- we are to avoid having people focus on us, stare at us, notice us. You know, Jesus is referring to something that was very common in that day. And, um, you know, if in that day, the, the religious leaders, they would come into the temple. I can't even really imagine this here. Uh, <laughs> but they would come into the temple There would be an entourage of people, and they would begin blowing trumpets, and everybody would turn around to look at who was blowing the trumpets, and then the religious leader would step forward in their robes and everything, you know, and step forward and hold their hand out and drop their their coin into the into the offering. Now that wouldn't work here because our box is really weird and it would just bounce off, right? But like That'd be pretty funny. You know, limos pull up and people come in and music's playing and everybody's like, what is happening? Someone walks over and, you know, and it just bounces off, you know. Uh, That's what happened in the temple. It was like all eyes on that that guy and and then look at what he just gave, you know. That was the goal. It was disgusting and everybody knew what Jesus was talking about here. Everybody knew. They, they had seen this many times. Jesus says, these guys, what they're doing, he reveals the true motive of their hearts. These false givers, they were not concerned about the poor. They were not concerned about the needy. Jesus says, what they wanted was to be admired. What they wanted was to be admired by others. They wanted to be worshipped. We're going to see this in just a minute. But the the thing we have to do is ask ourselves this. Why am I giving? This is what Jesus is telling us to do. Why am I giving? Why am I helping? What am I wanting? What am I trying to accomplish? Is this so that someone will see me and be impressed and think about me in a certain way? See what I have done. See what I have given. See what, you know, all of these things. And then think, man, that is a... That's a great person. Man, that's a godly person. Man, they're just, wow, they're something. You see, here's what I know. Deep within our hearts, it's in all of us. Deep within our hearts as people is a vile and wicked thing. It is a desire to be worshipped. We have this. In each and every one of us, we want to be worshipped as, as smart or as beautiful or as strong. We want people to look at us and think that we are something important and something more. We all have this. It's the basis of pride. 
It, 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 pride is the original sin that destroyed Lucifer, who became the devil and Satan, right? It says that, that it welled up within him. Pride was found in him. He wanted to be worshipped like the Most High. And ever since, that is within us. It's the reason celebrity culture even exists. Because there is this desire to be worshipped. And then, amazingly, right, we were built with this need to worship as well, right? Which is meant to be directed only at God. So here we are, right? There's all these people who want to be worshipped and then are built to worship. And, and what do you get out of that? Unless it's pointing to God, you get celebrity culture. You get, you get evil worship. But listen, it's because of this that we can often subtly point people to ourselves. And listen, if you're like really Christian, you just do this like in a more subtle way. We know we're not supposed to point to ourselves, so we can point to ourselves in a really subtle way. We can point to ourselves in a way that's just, it's not as obvious, but we're still pointing to ourselves, talking about what we have done, talking about what we have accomplished, pointing people to us so that people will think that we are something. Listen, this is an iceberg in the water. You don't want to do this. You know, um, when, I, when I study to prepare for Sundays, I, I pull open um, a template that I write my notes into. And it's a template that I've created. Um, and, and so there's a, a thing at the top of this template that is a warning to me. And it literally says, Chuck, you have to read this. It's in big red letters. And, and it says, do not ever, ever point to yourself. You point to Christ. And it even puts in a little parenthesis next to it. It says, even subtly. Right? Because we know how to do that. Right? It, 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 that, and, and it tells me, I have to read it, right? So as many times I go back and I read it. Oh, yes, that's right. You point to Christ. You point to Jesus. And when you look at, like, what's happening, right, you can hear what people are pointing to. They talk about what they have done. They talk about who they are. They talk about what they've accomplished. And it's just all me, me, me. It, listen, we are supposed to be people that point to him. Him. What he has done. Every good and perfect gift comes down from him. It has not been us. And so, so much of what Jesus warns us about in Matthew 6 is this very thing. Our desire is people to be exalted in the eyes of others. But Jesus has already told us what our good works are supposed to do. He said in Matthew 5, 16, he says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and worship you. That's not what it says. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and then glorify your Father who is in heaven. And you want to know if something is being done in the right way? Does it call attention to the person or does it call attention to the Lord? Who does it cause us to worship? Who does it cause us to exalt? What we do should point to Him. It should point, it should push people to worship Him. You know, sometimes I'll hear about things that you are doing for each other. And man, it blesses me. It's just so awesome. Someone will come and say, man... You don't know, we were, we were struggling and then somebody just took care of this thing and, or somebody just came over at the right moment or they just called at the right time. And I go, man, you know what it does? It makes me worship you. No, I'm just kidding. You're like, really? No, no, what it makes me do is go, you know what, that is so awesome, but it also makes me kind of bypass you and go, man, God, you're so good. God, you're so good that, that you saw the need and then you stirred people, right? Because here's what Philippians says. Philippians 2.13 says, It is God who works in you both to will and to do according to his good pleasure. And so I thank God who, who worked in the heart of the giver to make them a giver. And then I thank God who provided the resources so that the giver could give to the person who was in need. And then I thank God that he worked in the heart and in the mind of the person to, to see the need, to feel the need, and then to actually take the step to meet the need. I mean, right? We, we thank God for what God has done. We see your good works. 
and we glorify our Father who is in heaven. Well, that's not how these religious leaders were giving, okay? And it's definitely not how Hollywood gives today (laughs) with their film crews next to them and their live streaming social media posts, hashtag giving back, hashtag paying it forward, et cetera, et cetera, right? Listen, our Lord says, listen, don't give like that. Don't do that. Steer your boat in the opposite direction of of everything you've seen them do. Because look at the end of verse 1 there. It says, otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. So here's the choice, right? You have no reward from your Father in heaven. Do you know there's going to be a reward in heaven? This is beyond comprehension that there is a reward. Dave, do we deserve a reward for anything in this life? Nothing. Nothing. I mean, I feel like someone's going to sneak me in the side door, right? It's going to have to be Jesus because nobody else has the authority, but it's going to be like, listen, okay, here's the thing. You didn't make it, okay? (laughs) It didn't happen. But there's some fine print that I took care of. I'm going to slide you in. You just don't let anybody know, okay? You're not getting a badge or anything. Just, Just be happy you're there, okay? And I'd be like, that's fine. I'm good. How close can I be to you? That, that's cool. I'm good, you know, and, and my wife, you know, <laughs> right? Like, that's how I feel. It, but instead, there is this reward, which is crazy to think about, that we will be rewarded for anything. But here's what I want you to hear. I have done a, a, a pretty thorough search of the New Testament, and the word reward, there is never an instance in the New Testament that the word reward is plural, in Greek. It is always singular. In other words, what I'm saying is there are no rewards. There is one reward. Just one. One reward. And this reward gives you access to everything he wants to give to you, which is your entire inheritance. But there is only one reward. And you say, well, what is this one reward? Very simply, according to the Bible, the reward of heaven is this. It is whether or not he is happy with you. The reward of heaven is is his happiness with you. It is, however you might want to say that, him being proud of you. um, Him rejoicing over you. Him, his happiness with you is the reward of of heaven. There, are, there is no other reward of heaven. That is the reward. It's the singular reward of heaven. And this is going to be expressed by him taking and putting a crown of leaves on your head. It's not even a gold crown. It's just a crown of leaves on your head. And then him looking into your eyes and saying, well done. That's his way of saying, I am happy with you. I am proud of you. I am so happy with who you are, with what you did, with what you said, with how you stayed, with how you prayed, with how you trusted. Through it all, I am happy with you. That is the reward of heaven. It's well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy. So not sneaking you in the side door. Enter into the joy of your Lord. See, the point I'm trying to make is there's not rewards. It's not gift cards and prizes and plaques and trophies. And there's just one. His happiness with the way that you have lived your life, with the way you have spent your time, with the way that you have prayed, with the way you have used what he has given to you. We are told in various passages that we have the potential for our reward to be great, and that does not mean we get more things. It's talking about the greatness of his happiness with us, that that can grow, that he could be more happy with us. That's just beyond comprehension. So this is the reward that Jesus speaks about here in verse 1. And it is our reward, and it is from our Father, and notice that it is not here and now, it is in heaven. 
And it, it is the day that we enter heaven. The day we enter heaven and we see his face and hear are his words to us. Well done. Incredible. Now, in what Jesus says here, he makes clear uh, that choice. You have to choose. This is what we have to do. We have to decide. We have to choose today between these two rewards. There's only two possible rewards. And please hear me. You sacrifice the one to have the other and, and vice versa. So we either have the first reward, which is the reward of man, which is here on earth, right? And it's, that, is, that reward is to be seen by people, admired by people, thanked by people, exalted by people. That's the reward of man. That's the one. Or it is the reward of God, and that is to be seen by God and to be a, approved of by God and for Him to be happy with what we have, have done and with what we have given. And so the, the reward... Um, you know, we got to pick between these two things. And when you think about it, the reward from people here on earth is like temporary at best. Let me ask you this. How long are people impressed with you? I mean, listen, you could, let's just say, come in today wearing the coolest looking Hawaiian shirt ever. Okay? <laughs> I'm just saying. And you could be like, it's a really cool Hawaiian shirt, right? And like, maybe not the Hawaiian shirt, but most people won't even notice because they're coming in going, you know, I'm pretty much wearing the coolest looking button down shirt or whatever, right? Like, how often do people actually, how often are people impressed and how long does that even last? Half of a millisecond? Right? And this is what Jesus is telling us, right? This is temporary at best. I mean, man's applause, so fickle, one moment to the next. I mean, how long are people impressed with you and this is the reward that you're going to choose? When the reward from God is eternal, and please hear me, once it's said, that is what it is forever. Standing before the Lord... And he says, well done, and I am happy with you, and I am happy with what you've done and said and been and all these things. Can you imagine when God says that to you? That is what it is for a million, billion, trillion years. Times a million, billion, trillion years, it's never going to change. That is what God said about me. Now, you can't walk around like that because there's no pride in heaven, right? Hey, did you see what God said about me, right? Check out the badge, right? Here it is. It's all the things God said, right? But like we're going to be able to rejoice in that. But listen, that lasts forever and ever and ever. Oh, it's so, how foolish to choose the, the, the momentary applause of people in place of the eternal reward of God's happiness with us. But listen, you sacrifice the one to have the other. You can't have them both. You can't have the applause of people and have the approval of God. You sacrifice the one to gain the other. Jesus, when he says, take heed, that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them, otherwise you have no reward from your Father in heaven. That's what he's telling you. You want to brag to people? Have at it. But you are losing, you are giving up, you are sacrificing. By the way, it's always, I don't know about you, I'm very, I guess I'm very sensitive to this, but when people start to talk about themselves, it just, oh man, it bugs me so much. I have very little tolerance for it, it drives me crazy. I, I just can't handle it. I, I inevitably end up saying something like, what about the Lord, <laughs> you know? But it's like, that's because this is what we do as people. We want to be worshipped. So listen, I'm going to tell you about the things I've done and what I've accomplished. Man, we are sacrificing the eternal stuff doing that. So he asks us, weigh these two. Which would you rather, the momentary, the fleeing, or the forever? Well, it seems obvious to me. Okay, well, now that that's settled, look at verse 2. Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet. So remember, this is what Jesus was talking about. Do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets. Remember? This is what they did coming into the synagogue, but they also did it in the streets. Did you know that? They would come to the busy middle marketplace. They would do the same thing. The entourage would pull up. 
Trumpets would start to you know, go crazy. People would turn and look. And then the leader, the scribe, the Pharisee, the Sadducee, would, would step forward and hand a coin to the poor beggar. Right? All of it just to be seen. It was disgusting. But this is what they did. And Jesus says why they're doing it. Look at verse 2. That they may have glory from men. That was their goal. Not to help the beggar. Not to help the sick. Not to help the poor. But, but to have glory. The word glory means to, to think about something a certain way. And this is what they wanted. They wanted people to think they were something. They were important. They were, they were exalted in some way. They wanted, what we said before, they wanted worship. Well, here's what Jesus says. In doing this, they are trading the reward of God. Look what it says there in verse 2. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. What a sad trade. Have you ever uh, realized that you have done this after the fact? It's pretty miserable, honestly. When you brag about something that you've done and the Lord uh, then convicts you on it and then you just realized what you did and then you realize how little the payoff really was, (laughs) you think, man, I'm so foolish. It's a sad trade. I mean, to, to trade the reward of God, his approval for that momentary thing. I mean, think about it, right? These guys, two seconds later, that marketplace went back to buying and selling and trading, and whatever that guy did was completely forgotten about, wasn't even thought about again. But of course, for some of these, for some of these religious leaders, this was all part, I mean, this is appalling to think, but this was all part of a longer con It was a part of the whole thing that they were doing. What I mean by that is, for them, it was a necessary evil to give someone some money so that down the road, they could get that money back, if that makes sense. And listen, folks, this is happening today. It happens all over the place, right? It's called manipulation. And, 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 oh, so we'll do this so that we know we'll get that back. And, And... This is what was happening. These religious leaders, they looked apart everywhere they went so that they could get what they wanted from people when they wanted it. And man, we have to be careful. You want to know whether some, you know, religious leader, some pastor or teacher or whatever, you want to know if they're they're real, if they're legit. Are they pointing to Jesus Christ? Who do they point you to? Who do they point you to? Who do they talk about? They talk about you, talk about themselves, or do they talk about him? Who do they point you to? Well, here's what Jesus says. These guys, they're pointing everybody to themselves, and they have chosen their reward, and, and this is what they get. They've got their reward. Well, what Jesus says in verse 3 is going to help you and I to never become these kind of people. Uh, look what it says, verse 3. But when you do... A charitable deed. Do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Now, if you are very, very religious, you might have a problem with the way that you see Jesus. Do you think Jesus was ever funny? He was. He was being very funny here. But maybe for you, you can't see Jesus as being funny. Maybe you only think of Jesus like super serious, right? Like he was always just walking around very solemn like he was baptized in lemon juice, you know? And like the paintings always show him. I don't know why it's two fingers, Boy Scout or something. I don't know what that is, right? But it's always the two fingers. Like Jesus just sort of walked around the countryside like, peace to you, peace to you, peace to you, you know? Soft-spoken, no, no outbursts of, you know, not, not funny, just very, very serious. Like, hey, don't, don't bug Jesus. He's got stuff. He's like holding up the universe. You know what I mean? Like, stay away from him. Well, this is what the disciples thought of Jesus for a minute. The little kids wanted to come and play with Jesus. Okay? That, that's as simple as that was. The little kids wanted to come and play with him. And the disciples were like, hey, hey, kids, get out of here. Don't you realize he's busy? He's got stuff. He's got things going on. You know? And Jesus is like, what's wrong with all you knuckleheads? Like, let me play with the little kids, Right? Like, they, they just didn't get it, right? So, so maybe you don't think Jesus was funny. Well, listen, he's being funny here. Like, when he says, 
don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. The crowd would have chuckled. They would have thought, oh man, that's Jesus, he's so funny. <laughs> oh man, he's good. You know? They would have laughed. How do you not let your left hand know what your right hand's doing? Jesus, right? So what's he saying? Simple. He's saying don't make a big deal out of what you're doing. In some way, you have to ignore what you did. That's what he's saying. Don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Somehow ignore what you've done. What does that mean? Well, it means I don't keep record of it. It means I don't call attention to it. It means I'm not trying to make it known. Let me answer this question. Is it okay to get a tithe record at the end of the year? Sure, it's fine, okay? Is it okay to get a charitable contribution thing for your taxes? Yes, it's fine. The point here, right, is that we are in some way ignoring what we're doing. We're not calling attention to it. We're not trying to get thanks. We're not trying to be worshipped. We're not trying to be elevated in people's minds. Listen, giving to God is done correctly when God moves us to give. We move into action, and then we move on. Just move on. Well, uh, let's see, I gave this and I gave that, and uh, let me make sure I let everybody know. We don't do that. We move on. So here's what he's saying. So verse 4 tells us, in some way, it needs to be in secret. Look what it says, that your charitable deed may be essentially done in secret. Now listen, this doesn't mean that no one can ever see you helping someone else, okay? Don't take it further than Jesus intends us to. Like you got to be some kind of secret service, like ninja giver kind of thing, right? Like roll in, throw cash at someone and roll back out of the room before anybody saw you. It's not what Jesus is talking about, okay? If you pulled over to help somebody with their flat tire, you do not have to jump into the bushes every time a car goes by so that you don't lose your reward, okay? Like if you're going to take care of someone's groceries, you don't have to tell the clerk, look away now, look away as I swipe my card, right? I don't want to lose my reward. Don't be that Christian, okay? Don't do that, okay? I said, I'm I got to clear this restaurant right now because I'm going to pay this person's bill, and I don't want anybody to know. So everybody, there's a fire except you. Stay, right? I'm going to pay your bill. Don't go too far. The issue here is motive. In all of this, the question is, what is the motive of our hearts? Is it to be seen? Is it to be thanked? Is it to be known? Is it to be admired? What is the motive of our heart? If so, if those are our motives, it is wrong. These are wrong motives, and we're sacrificing the reward of God. But if the motive of our heart is genuinely not to be seen, not to be glorified, not to be thanked, if the motive is really just to help the person who is in need, then listen, even if somebody becomes aware of it, even if somebody happens to see it, you know, you, they see you paying the groceries, they see you slipping the, the envelope into the mailbox or whatever, it's okay. You haven't lost your reward. You haven't traded it because the motive is right. Now, what Jesus says here is just another plea for us to choose wisely. Look what he says. And your father who sees in secret will himself reward you openly. So there's the choice. Do you want people to see it or do you want the Lord to see it? And it's pretty clear in the text. If you want people to see it, God's ignoring it. So we think, well, man, I kind of wanted both. Doesn't work like that. Well, God, you remember, God says, I didn't see it. Ouch, right? But to not be seen by people, here's the encouragement, he does see it. He does see it. He sees it and he rewards it. Now, Look what it says before we wrap up our time. Notice this reward, very simple, is given to us by him. That's what I want you to hear. Your father who sees in secret will himself reward you openly. So he doesn't assign an angel to give this reward. Hey, just so you know, the Lord says he's happy with you. That'd probably be enough for me. I got to be honest with you. But it goes way beyond that. It's he himself rewarding you. And here's what I want you to see. How does he do it? He does not, he will not reward us in secret. 
He's not going to call us aside again in heaven and be like, listen, good job on a couple of those things, okay? Now take your reward and scoot on, right? <laughs> don't, don't tell anybody. It says he will reward us openly. He will reward you openly. Here's what I want you to hear. You are going to stand in heaven in front of a million billion angels. You're going to stand in heaven in front of every person who has ever lived. And he is going to declare how happy he is with you publicly in front of everybody for everyone to hear. That is incredible. Think about what that means. You wanted some people to know? How about all the people? What is it going to mean when you stand there that day and the Lord says how happy he is with you in front of everyone? This is what it is. In that moment, what he says, that is what it will be forever. Nothing will ever change it. In that moment, what he says will be the thing that matters most to you. Listen, you are not going to care about gold streets and pearl gates. That is the the building materials of heaven. You're not going to care about any of that. You're not going to care about money. You don't need money. You're not going to care about stuff. You don't need stuff. What are you going to care about? It is this reward of heaven, his happiness with you, his pleasure over your life. And literally everything that affords you, everything is given to you because he's happy with you. Folks, I would just encourage you to choose today to be a funnel for the Lord, for him to use your life for his purposes and not to be a jar. But listen, maybe you sit here today and uh, you don't know the Lord. You've never given your life to Jesus Christ. If that's you today... Uh, It's very simple. You have to decide to humble yourself. You have to decide that you are no longer going to worship yourself. You're going to worship God. That's what's required. The Bible says you must repent of sin and you must believe. That's how a person is saved. But to repent means I have to humble myself and recognize that I am not God and that He is. Here's the amazing thing. If you are willing today, He is willing to save you. He is willing to forgive you. He is willing to accept you and receive you. Listen, why would you trade this temporary thing for all of eternity? Choose wisely today. Turn to the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. He's begging you. But the choice is yours. Let's pray together. Lord, we love you. We thank you so much for your mercy and your kindness and your love for us. We don't deserve it. It's amazing that there will be reward in heaven. Lord, we we don't deserve that either. But Lord, we thank you just for being so good, Lord. I pray now, Lord, for anybody watching or listening that does not yet have a relationship with you. They've not humbled themselves and turned to you in repentance and in belief to be saved. If, If that's you, just... The Lord knows that and now you know that and so turn to him right now and humble yourself and admit your need. Turn to Jesus Christ and admit, I am a sinner, I need you, I need salvation. I don't want to trade everything for nothing. Save me now. Talk to him, he's listening to you. Lord, we thank you that there is salvation in your name. There is not salvation in any other. but There is salvation in your name, and we thank you, Lord. We love you. We give our hearts and lives to you. Help us to be these funnels, Lord, for you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.